Hello friends, this is Ian Khan and welcome to the Ian Khan Show. You're watching an Aftershock special episode. Today's guest is Barry Vacker. Barry is a media theorist and a mixed artist whose work span the intersection of art, film, media, science, technology and philosophy. He's author of numerous books and articles. Vacker's recent books include the third edition of Media Environments, Black Mirror and Critical Media Theory. Vacker's TV and radio interviews include talking with Anderson Cooper about The Matrix and Studio 360 Public Radio International about 2001 A Space Odyssey. Barry is co-founder of the annual Temple Acrosanti program where students travel to the eco-city in Arizona to study media, ecology and technology. Barry is also co-contributor with me and a total of 50 global futurists to the recent book Aftershock. Here's my conversation with Barry Vacker. Barry, welcome to the Ian Khan podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you on board because of the critical work that you're doing. I want to paint a picture for our uh, listeners. Again, I spoke about Aftershock, uh, which is, um, you know, the 50 years after um, uh, Toffler wrote, uh, wrote Future Shock, where is the world at? And Barry, yourself, and 50 other incredible futurists in the, across the world came together, put this work together. And I'm recommending all of my listeners and viewers to buy this from Amazon. I don't think it's more than 20 or 25 bucks, but this is amazing. Barry, I've got so many questions for you because the conversation we're gonna have, I think is going to have a lot of value for our listeners. Tell me in your words, who are you? Who are you, Barry? Who am I? Uh, well, I'm Barry Vacker, a mixed media artist. I sort of con consider myself a theorist of big ideas and big spaces. I also teach media studies at Temple University in Philadelphia, and I've written books, edited books, uh, done artworks, and uh, a, a, a variety of different things, all dealing with uh, uh, similar themes. Um, most recently, my most recent book is uh, Black Mirror and Critical Media Theory. And I also did a book called Spectre of the Monolith, which was inspired by 2001 A Space Odyssey and lays out a wholly original space philosophy as we take our first steps uh, off our planet in the 21st century. Amazing. So in, there's so much to that. There's so much to that than, you know, beyond what you just said. In Aftershock, and I read your chapter in Aftershock, you talk a lot about space. You talk a lot about the world you know, us being in space and, and what that leads to the, 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 the pressure. Uh, you know, you've written about uh, we're the center of nothing. And I really like that, that, hey, where's that reference coming from? We thought we were everything. We're the center of the universe. So I want to ask you a couple of different questions. So Toffler talked about the super industrialized society, and that obviously has a lot of impact on us today. You mentioned just before we got started on the impact of light pollution. Are these two connected? Absolutely. The super industrialized society that Toffler wrote about has created a planetary civilization that provides many, many benefits to the human species. Of course, many of those benefits are a detriment to the other species on the planet. And uh, the one in my essay that I mentioned is the effect of light pollution. And uh, what you see behind me is a, a fluorescent light, two fluorescent lights dangling down uh, a map of light pollution in the United States. And this is part of a large uh, uh, 12 foot, six foot by 12 foot um, uh, installation I'm doing uh, commenting on, on that condition. And so what has happened in our super industrialized civilization is we've created a light bubble that has done a couple of things. Our cities are aglow, but we've pushed nature very far away, and we've erased the night skies from our consciousness. And so nature and the universe are very removed from our daily existence as we uh, scroll on our phones and scroll through our Twitter feeds, etc. And I think that bubble of cosmic narcissism, unintentionally affected by the invention of the electric light, is... is um, as uh, a lot of serious things to think about, and we need to, to think about those very clearly because in that realm of light, it seems as if we're the center of everything, the center of all value, all purpose, all meaning, yet our space telescopes, which are one of the greatest achievements of the human species, the telescopes looking out off our planet, those terrestrial ones, and the ones at space tell a very different story. 
that we're part of a majestic, vast, evolving universe of two trillion galaxies in which we're the center of nothing. And I think that that idea uh, has a lot of implications. One, that as we move into space, we tread lightly where we go. We pursue radical wonder, not uh, strip mining the moon and terraforming Mars into a suburb of Earth. I think our current plans for going off Earth echo the, some of the worst features of our super industrialized society. Uh, there's a couple of things you mentioned which are, which are very interesting. Cosmic narcissism. Now, absolutely. I mean, I was watching a movie just a few days ago on a flight from somewhere to somewhere, and it was Ad, As, Ad Astra, which is the new movie with Brad Pitt in it. Yes. And this is 2060, 2070, I believe. And he goes on this journey into space, going to Neptune and beyond. And I thought to myself, well, this maybe will be possible in, in, in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. But it just showed me a different perspective of who are we like in that big cosmos, if you will, that we're so tiny, but then sometimes with our actions and with our, uh, with our, you know, with how we do things, we just feel we're, we're, we're the center of everything. And that's the imbalance, isn't it? In the world where there's just two contrasts of the rich and the poor, the privileged and the suffering, the whatever, there's all contrasts of all kind. Yes. As well as the idea of human versus nature, human versus all the other species. So there's a lot of ways of colonization and conquest that have evolved from our planetary, industrial, or hyper-industrial, super-industrialized society. The thing is, we are tiny, but we're also very brainy. And I think without a doubt, the sort of the greatest intellectual achievement of our species is to figure out from our tiny little planet, a speck orbiting one star in the Milky Way among trillions of galaxies, that we've been able to map out a cosmic evolution that spans at least 13.7 billion years, stretching across about 100 billion light years, numbers so vast we can't comprehend them in our, in our daily existence, but it shows how great we can be when we apply our reason and our wonder and our curiosity and our art and our science to those things, yet we treat that discovery as if it means nothing for what's happening down on Earth, and I think that's a big mistake. One of the things we've learned since the Apollo program is the need to protect the ecosystems of this planet. The view that Apollo 8 and 11 and others provided by looking down on Earth, realizing that indeed we are a single species sharing one planet with millions of other species in the universe. And that, that view, that perspective inspired a lot of the ecological movements but I don't think it's inspired too much of our philosophical movements because what we're seeing, especially with regard to space, and as I've written in my book, Spectre of the Monolith, we're extending many of the worst features out into space, weaponization, militarization, uh, militarization uh, the idea that we should terraform Mars into a suburb of Earth and strip mining the moon. I think all of these are the kind of things that we fought wars for on Earth and we're gonna send those out into space I think that seems like a very regressive vision. In fact, I kind of think we're moonwalking into the future. It looks like we're going forward into space, but we're really going backwards. The telescopes are forward thinking, but the idea that we should colonize these places and then effectively conquer them, I think is very regressive and actually a mistaken way to proceed off our planet. You, you mentioned a few things that I was going to ask you about moon landing conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, paranormal worldviews, the weaponization of space, and terraforming Mars and strip mining the moon. Let's talk about these in a little, little bit more detail. Now, the Apollo moon landing, and we're not trying to debunk conspiracy theories here, but the Apollo moon landing was a significant event, I believe, in the history of mankind because absolutely, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody else has claimed to be on the moon since then. And People have tried and we've tried. And although the moon is not far away, it's just one of those things that was done and it sets a precedent for space exploration. I really like the story of SpaceX. And I show this video uh, to everybody that I speak with, uh, usually at events where SpaceX is launching, uh, landing these two rocket ships back on the ground and they're perfectly synchronized and everything looks great. And I really believe that we are potentially 
witnessing a, an era in space travel that that that's a breakthrough time that's something really significant can you talk a little bit about how do you see today's space exploration being uh, an era where we actually can make progress and which is something of a breakthrough is it a breakthrough well i think that the fact that it seems that we're returning to the moon and mars i think is sort of naively accepted has progress. We have technological progress, uh, no doubt, with things happening at SpaceX. But I challenge the notion that strip mining the moon, getting its water, retrieving its water, I uh, suggest that is not progress at all. That's the, that, is the, that is the appearance of progress. We should go to the moon and we should study it perhaps explore it in places, but I think the moon should be treated as a cosmic wilderness area. It should be treated like a national park and be protected in its entirety from any kind of economic ex exploitation. I mean, can't you landfills in the craters, billion year old craters filled with landfill uh, residue from the strip mining? Because that's what we're heading for. If yeah. this uh, industrial conquest view of the moon is not challenged. So tell me a little bit more about the strip mining. For, for those of our viewers who are not from industry, what, 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 is that, what, that, what does that comprise of? What is the strip mining of the moon? Uh, and, and, and why should we or think or not think about uh, colonizing Mars? What are, these, what are the goods and the bads about these? Uh, go to Mars. We should go to the moon. We should study them. We should explore them. We should appreciate their beauty, what they tell us about the evolution of our solar system, possibly the evolution of life in our solar system, if we haven't discovered microbial life in some way, which I think is going to happen sooner or later. But I think it's human hubris and human narcissism to think that we should just go to the moon and strip mine it. Since when is industrial value in space outweighing the aesthetic and scientific and artistic value? And I Absolutely. think what we're doing is we're sending like a, a 19th century industrial vision to the moon as opposed to one in which we tread lightly and appreciate the awesomeness of the landscapes of the moon. You know, it's, it was a little bit too late to protect wide areas of the American Southwest, but we have numerous national parks out there that are at least preserving some areas, and they're a big, huge tourist draw precisely because they are still largely untouched or largely wilderness. So my take is, is that going to the moon requires that we tread lightly that we appreciate the wonder and the beauty, but I don't think we need to go there and strip mine it, especially for stuff to be consumed back on earth or the idea that we need the minerals or whatever. I said, when we do that, we are proving that we are the threat, leaving this planet going into space, we will be the threat, not the other species, perhaps. Absolutely. Let's talk I, about- I wanna, But I wanna be clear about this. I think SpaceX is giving us the illusion of progress. It's great to launch the rockets and stuff, but we should go to Mars and study it, appreciate it. We need to send our artists and our philosophers and our scientists to Mars. Yeah. Yep. Not dudes out there with the computers and the industrial technology strip mining it and polluting and marring yep. these beautiful landscapes. I think that our, what we've revealed, unveiled about the universe with our space telescopes undermines our thinking that we have the right to go take from those planets. There's nothing more narcissistic than just going and taking and claiming and disrupting the natural beauty that's already there and the things that we can discover from that. So yeah. my idea for progress in space is to protect moon and the Mars. Moon and the Mar, I'm sorry. My uh, idea for progress in space is to protect Mars and the moon as wilderness areas that we tread very lightly on. Absolutely. And I'm not talking about separating one little 50 square mile area of Mars is protected yeah. and we trample the rest. I think it's just the opposite. If we protected 99.999% of Mars, there would still be about 500 square miles that humans could occupy and tread lightly on, maybe have a hotel there. We could have some camping and hiking and things like that, but we don't need to go turn it into a suburb of Earth. I think that is a deeply flawed mistake and it's actually going backwards under the illusion of going forwards. Yes. Now, uh, thank you. That's, that's fantastic. I love it. Now, given the evolution of technology, and there's many theories out there, one of our co-collaborators for the book um, uh, has, has uh, done a profound amount of work on, on the evolution of, um, of, of technology over the past. And they say that 
technology is expanding at an exponential pace. It's it's moving faster. It's growing faster. Moore's yes, power, law has yeah. yeah powered by Moore's law exactly. Right. Yeah. Moore's law has been broken now. It's it's just way past that, and it's not following a linear curve anymore. And whatever innovative uh, breakthroughs we're going to see are going to be much faster in the next few years to the extent that by the year 2025, and these are just predictions based on what we're seeing, by the year 2025, the uh, mental capacity of computing capacity of a machine will be equivalent to that of a human being. And by to the year 2025, we might see something called the era of the singularity. We may or we may not, but that's the general curve that we're following. Given that idea, and given the advent of things such as artificial intelligence or uh, severe automation in not even industry 4.0, but the fifth industrial revolution, there's so many different things that people are talking about. And for an average regular Joe or regular girl, it's difficult to understand what impact does that have on their everyday lives because not everybody lives in the world of futurism and space exploration. People live regular lives. What message can we offer to those people who are contributing to society, who are the artists, who are uh, you know, the people with, with, their, with their passions in the world that are doing something good? What message should we give to them given that technology is rapidly expanding, space exploration is happening, some companies and some organizations want to you know, take the fight to, the, to a different level, conquer space, how should an average person look at these changes and, and do what with it is my, is my big question. Well, I think that the average person uh, is the moviegoer and uh, they go to the movies, they see Star Wars or Star Trek or Interstellar or Ad Astra and they sort of get sort of a, absorb this sort of worldview. And if you look at what Hollywood delivers for the average person, most uh, almost all space movies are monsters or uh, human conflict and human warfare. Star Wars itself kind of illustrates the failure of a sane space narrative because we extend our warfare off the planet the, the in contrast that to the original Star Trek narrative, which was we would go into spe space as a unified species and go pursue knowledge and understanding and try not to get involved in too many conflicts as possible. Whereas the Star Wars narrative, which is the dominant narrative, is just the opposite of that. So I think that for the average person, we need to let them know that space is a place that someplace they may be venturing as the costs come down because as this exponential acceleration of technology happens, it will bring the cost down just like airfare used to be really expensive and only the elite could fly. And now almost everybody can fly if they want to. The same thing will happen with space travel. It may take longer. Well, but what I suggest in my essay is that we make, need to make sure that we're going into space with the right motives. And I think uh, Virgin Galactic has a much better space philosophy than SpaceX because one of their key points of their philosophy is the idea of being able to see the Milky Way from the space or see Earth from space and absorb the awe and wonder that we feel with that and in which it makes you feel connected to the life on the planet and it makes you feel connected to all the species on the planet when you realize that we're sharing it. That's a very different kind of feeling than one gets when uh, you're in the Star Wars thing and you feel like your tribe is conquering or something like yeah. that. And I think we just have to get outside the conquest mode which dominates our space narratives today. Whether it's Hollywood or the policy wonks in DC, that is almost exclusive to the narrative. We will go into space, we'll, all the nations will compete, we're weaponizing it, we're militarizing it, we're sending religion to, religions into a space, and who knows what all kinds of weapons the Pentagon is developing. And uh, as when you compare the Apollo 11 moon landing and the view of going to the moon for all mankind or all humankind, it's now for all my kind. And it's just pillaging and conquest. And uh, I don't see how that's progress. And I think SpaceX is deeply invested in this and uh, they're deeply invested in it with the Pentagon and the military industrial complex in the, in the United States. So I don't think SpaceX really represents progress. They represent mm. the technology progress. Mm. But this is why the philosophers and the thinkers need to step in and question exactly what Elon Musk and these others want to do with these technologies. And 
that uh, the fact that I might be against terraforming Mars into a suburb of Earth doesn't mean that I'm against the future of human exploration. I think going into space and what we've discovered is our greatest intellectual achievement as a species. But because of what we discovered, we need a different way of approaching, and that is pursue radical wonder, tread lightly where we go, and go in peace. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's much more uh, to, to us as people and human beings than just, you know, conquesting and going about conquering different uh, places. Yeah, Ian, that, that, I agree with you. That, and that's what I've been arguing. That's what I've been writing about the last several years. And that is, but that is the dominant narrative. In fact, you know, President Trump now commissioned a space force. Yeah. And the Absolutely. National Cathedral is, uh, com, you know, is sanctioned a space Bible. Yeah. And um, I mean, come on, really, let's think about this. We're militarizing space. And in fact, Elon Musk allegedly tweeted that Starfleet begins because the Space Force has been found in this so out of touch with what is happening. It's completely naive for, for that tweet. Yeah, and so yeah. I think we just really need to rethink. You know, Toffler, the title of my article on Aftershock is called Naked into the Cosmos, yeah. Future Shock in Space. And Toffler wrote about this very condition in which why should we send people into space unprotected for the radical change? And so we spend billions of dollars protecting the astronauts and the explorers from the elements of space, but we spend very little time protecting from the elements of philosophical change. And we need a new philosophy for how we proceed outward into space that can have competition, but we need to uh, uh, I would say cooperative, friendly competition, but we need to proceed out as a species, not a Absolutely. gang of tribes ready to plunder. That's the 19th century. Absolutely. Do you see uh, more of a, a, a stronger, uh, let's say, region emerging in this uh, era to conquer space? I, I think those lines have blurred out like 20 or 30 years ago, you had the Soviet Union versus the, versus the United States. But right now, you see a lot of technology, a lot of um, investment into newer ideas happening in, in China, as an example. And I'm not saying they're going out there and conquering space. But, but there's definitely the, the, you know, a lot more emphasis on automation in China uh, or other parts of the world. Uh, do you see a dominant trend in the next five or 10 years as to who would come out to be stronger? I, I know this, don't answer the question like it's, it's a fixed thing, but what do you see happening over the next few years? Who, who could be doing something significant that we should follow is my question. Uh, I'll be quite blunt, I don't see it anywhere. Mm. I think it looks like it's gonna be nationalist competition going into space, which, and that's with regard to sending humans out. But if you look at uh, the greatest technologies like the Large Hadron Collider, the Hubble Space Telescope, the uh, upcoming James Webb Telescope, many of those are cooperative endeavors of involving scientists, scientific organizations, and universities from many countries. Of course, yeah. Recently, I was at the McDonald Observatory in far west Texas where I own some uh, ranch land and uh, they have some of the largest telescopes in the world are there and they're operated and funded by some of the leading research universities in the world. So we're the space telescope and the terrestrial telescope. That's the model we need to follow in the space. Absolutely. One in which we cooperate among nations, not needlessly compete and certainly not weaponize for warfare in space. And, and, uh, What's amazing about at the telescopes, at least at the McDonald Observatory, you can go up and visit them. They give tours. It's all very a wonderful, cool experience. Yeah. But it's and it's a very different feel than what you get in your cities, where everybody is glued to a screen and there's tribal conflict happening among yeah. all types of peoples. And it's and we just need to reframe our narratives. It won't be easy, but I think yeah. Toffler was correct when he diagnosed uh, what we're at. We, we, in space, we still face the premature arrival of the future. And that's the diagnosis of future shock, the essence of it, the premature arrival of the future. And so what we're extending now into space is not a future. It's the future from the 1900s, yeah, yeah. at least with regard to humans venturing out. Yeah. Our ability to extend our eyes and ears out with our space telescopes is beautiful. We need to continue that but we need to take what we're doing when we extend bodies out and follow the models provided by the space telescopes. Absolutely. And, you know, at the beginning of your essay on, on the book is a really nice quote by, uh, by Toffler. That's how strange, therefore, 
uh, that when we hurl a man into the future, we take a few pains to protect him from the shock of change. It is as though NASA had shot Armstrong and Aldrin naked into the cosmos. I just love that. And it's just so real and so profound to, yeah, it, to, to, it, to say it, that. It, it, absolutely is one of the most profound observations ever made about space and what happened. And it's hard to understand or grasp for us now in 2020, the amount of world dialogue among artists and philosophers that was generated by the Apollo moon landing. But then no one really knew what to make of it. There was no general consensus of what it meant other than some kind of awe-inspiring thing that a billion people watched on television. In fact, the, the Apollo 11 moon landing is still probably, not, if not the most largest television event, it's right up there with the very top, the audience way larger yeah, yeah. than any Super Bowl. Yeah. So, so Topham was right about that. And I think w what we need to do is send our, our species out into space armed with the best of our contemporary 21st century philosophy, not scroll sacred texts from ancient eras and ancient pre-scientific uh, worldviews. I just don't think that's going to cut it. And I don't think we need to send all the industrials out into space. We need to end our warfare on this planet, contain it to this planet, and send ourselves out into space with the same secular philosophy that sees all members of the earth as members of the human species that we share with all the others on the planet. And we pursue out to pursue this radical wonder and to go peacefully and tread softly. And I know I've said that a couple of times, so I don't want to emphasize that point. Because once you, the astronauts all say that once they looked down and saw Earth, they had this, Ed, Edgar Mitchell said it perfectly, an explosion of awareness. Yeah. And I think that's what's missing inside our cities is this explosion of awareness. We get it momentarily when we see a Hubble deep field image or something coming in from one of the other telescopes and we yeah. or temporarily, our mind is expanded momentarily on our, on our tiny screens, but we need to extend that deeper into our fabric of our society. And this is where I think Virgin Galactic has a, it's not a perfect space narrative, but it's much better. And I think Richard Branson's idea that we would go into space to appreciate the wonder and the majesty is a good first step. Absolutely. Barry, I wish we had more time and we could just talk for hours and hours. Tell me a little bit more um, to conclude about your work at, uh, at, at, at Temple University and also where people could find you and find more information about you. Okay, well, I'm, um, I'm Barry Vacker, Associate Professor in the Klein College of Media and Communication at Temple University in the heart of uh, Philadelphia. And um, I, do, I teach critical media studies, and uh, I've authored books. I've authored, uh, I should say, I've edited textbooks and anthologies that are used in classrooms. I've author, uh, authored books and numerous essays. And for the audience here, uh, my 2017 book is called Specter of the Monolith, and it's inspired by 2001 and Interstellar. But it explores what all the space films have had to say about human future in space. And so I look at them extensively. I also discuss future shock in there. So we look at 2001 and Planet of the Apes very closely. So it's a, it's a radically different kind of book. You can find it in Amazon, Spectre of the Monolith. And of course, they know what the monolith is referring to there. And the book presents a call for a new kind of philosophy, which I outline uh, in the book. And you can also find my essays online. It, uh, academia.edu. If you just do Barry Vacker, academia.edu, uh, it'll show up there. I also have a collection of essays in Medium. Uh, it's uh, Medium Barry Vacker, and I have essays about uh, ancient aliens and uh, the Apollo moon landings, why they're not, why they were not faked. In fact, those are my two most read essays, getting thousands of reads. And uh, by the way, I, can I add one little thing uh, real quick please, about the Apollo yeah, moon landing? Yeah, yes, please do, please do. If they faked it the first time, if NASA faked it the first time, why go back five more times and risk getting caught five more times? Five more times. It makes no sense. There's a lot of other stuff in that essay. But so, so yeah, I'm a professor at Temple University, but I also I do all kinds of things. Oh, one other thing. I'm also a mixed media artist, and I've just uh, started a large uh, a collection of, uh, of art artworks about the Anthropocene and also about uh, space and uh, involving the Hubble telescope, the James Webb telescope. So mm -hmm. some mixed media things that are in process as well. Where's and, that available? Uh, Where's that mixed media art available for? Um, well, it's, it's, in my, it's all in my studio right now. It was at an exhibit in Toronto this past summer. But if you uh, just uh, did uh, Barry Vacker, um, 
medium. It, there's essays that will come up that I have some essays that I've written explaining the art exhibit and what we did. Okay. And um, Amazing. there's also uh, an essay that I connect uh, the Hubble telescope up to media theory, uh, a lot of radical stuff in that. It's called Hot and Cool in the Media Scene. Yeah. And that's M E D I A S C E E. C E N E, right? Me yep. seeing as an anthropocene. Yep. You can yep. find it online. If you just Google Perfect. that, it'll come up. All right. Barry, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I hope uh, people are buying uh, Aftershock and, and yes. learning from it. And of course, your book, Spectre of the Monolith, which I'm going to check out from Amazon.com. But thank you so much. And um, let's hope the future is brighter uh, and we respect space for what it is and, and the you know the galactic awesomeness that that's out there and we just learn from it and and yeah, learn I to be humble a, i should have had a picture of cover my i should have had my book here to show the cover of it but uh any i guess i wasn't thinking about the marketing aspects but no Ian, worries. thank you thank you so much barry and we'll see you soon hey friend this is ian khan if you liked what you saw on my video then please subscribe to my youtube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh updated and ready for the future for more information also visit my website at iankhan.com